Hello friends and welcome back to part 2 of my list of 10 world building mistakes that DMs make. If you haven't seen part 1, they don't really need to be watched in order, but I would suggest that you eventually check out both. Creating an entire world for a D&D game is a daunting process and I think it's inevitable that you'll make some mistakes while trying to get everything together. So I hope that you don't see the things on this list as anything to be embarrassed about. Instead, I hope that they'll give you some new insights so you can approach your world building in a way that's easier for you and more fun for your players. Players. Now let's jump right back into it with mistake number six. Another common mistake, and something that's actually touched on in the DMG's section about campaign events, is designing a world that's very stable and unchanging. This is the king, here are his lands. This is the area where the giants live, beware. These ships have a regular trade route that goes to these ports in these countries. But instability generates change, change generates conflict, and conflict makes for good storytelling. What if the king vanished on a diplomatic trip? Everyone is looking for him, and tensions have become high with the country that he was visiting, as many suspect foul play? What if the giants are migrating, bringing waves of attacks? What if ships have started disappearing on this route and there are rumors of a giant sea serpent? You can certainly choose to create a flat, stable world and then superimpose adventure onto it. You can have a firm, long-standing monarchy and a group of giants that live in one spot and a naval trade route that works as intended, and also have exciting quests in your world. But consider that building some instability into your world will naturally lead to adventure. When you create these points of instability, you don't even have to use the resultant conflict as your main plot. But if these kind of changes are actually happening in your world, it creates depth and makes everything feel more real. Plus, it can create a sense of urgency when your players understand that this world isn't an unchanging sandbox that they can play in at will, but a living world that will change around them. If they choose to ignore the giant migration, maybe they'll come back to this town later and find it destroyed and vacant. If they ignore the rumors of the missing ships, they might find it more and more difficult to locate certain items, like healing potions, as trade shipments go missing. Most of us aren't playing D&D in order to recreate real life. That's kind of the opposite of what fantasy means. And while everyone has different levels of interest in the realism of their fantasy worlds, if you prioritize realism over what's fun or what's interesting, you are gonna have a problem. I think we can all agree that we would rather play a game that's unrealistic but enjoyable over the alternative of a game that's very realistic but no fun to play. For example, in my homebrew game, I spaced a lot of my cities really far apart from each other because I thought that was the most realistic way for them to have developed. But the result of this spacing was that I functionally trapped my players in one spot by making travel time consuming and difficult. And when my players did want to move, it was immensely boring because they couldn't get anywhere without being on the road for days at a time. And at the time, I had no idea how to handle that. This especially sucked because I had big plans for these other cities and wanted my players to go there, but I had accidentally disincentivized them to travel by building my world this way. Now, some people love having long distance travel in their games, and that is fine. But for me and my players, this wasn't an intentional choice we were making. This was just me prioritizing what I thought was realistic over the kind of game we actually wanted to play. A lot of D&D rules as written violate realism in favor of something that makes gameplay easier, less complicated, or more fun. Like fall damage, or the types of horrific injuries that can be cured with a good night's sleep. Internal consistency is generally more important than realism. Your rivers don't have to follow the laws of physics. Your world's biomes don't need to hold up to examination by an ecologist. Unless, of course, that's fun for you. If a question comes up that hinges on realism, your answer will set a precedent. So be prepared for the precedent that you want to set. You are completely allowed to let your players know that you're not trying to recreate real life, and that your ruling stands in your fantasy world regardless of how things work in the real world. Jenny. Oh no. Is this a Christmas Carol parody? I have to be up at seven. Oh good, so you know I'm from the past. Remember last year when you waited too long to get gifts for your D&D party and then just brought cookies like a total chump? That's not gonna happen this year. It's only... Oh god, it's December. Cobalt Press can save you from your past. They make tons of supplements for 5th edition. Everything from spells to subclasses, campaign settings to monsters. Ginny, I am- No, she's got it. Move on. Oh, okay. 
I'm from the present. Cobalt Press's pocket editions make the perfect gifts. Deep Magic, a collection of new spells and subclasses for every spellcasting class. Or over a thousand new monsters and foes between Tome of Beasts 1 and 2 and the Creature Codex. All these in convenient, portable soft cover. Get 15% off your entire order with the code Ginny December 15 off. And get a free PDF of Prepared 2, a dozen one shot adventures for 5th edition. Sure, sure. It's like 3 a.m. Can we get the third ghost out here and wrap this up? Gin. No, it's fine. Stop. I see. A Ginny who placed her order from Cobalt Press this very week and received all her gifts in time for the holidays. Great job. Nice performance. I'll order in the morning. Order now. The links are in the description. We'll leave when you get your confirmation email. This is probably unsurprising to anyone who knows that I'm basically a self-employed one-woman show, but I'm a pretty type A person. I put a lot of pressure on myself to do something absolutely perfectly, and if I mess it up, it's very easy to interpret that as an overall failure. So when I say this, I say this with love and understanding, but you're gonna mess stuff up. You're gonna have inconsistencies. You're gonna change your mind about things. You're gonna accidentally write something in that totally spirals out of control, and that is okay. If you set the expectation for yourself that you're gonna write a perfectly cohesive, realistic, functional world, and then present it to your players fully formed, and it will work flawlessly for an entire campaign, you are going to be disappointed. One of the kindest and most useful things you can do for yourself when building a world is to allow yourself the space to make those mistakes and the space to fix them. Remember, this is a game that we're playing for fun. We're not contractually obligated to stick with whatever decisions we make in the fictional dungeon game. Don't be afraid of making changes, admitting to mistakes, retconning, talking honestly with your players about how things are going. There's a huge difference between a world making sense in your head and a world making sense when you spread it out on the gaming table and let a bunch of people stick their fingers in it. The easiest way to end up with a world that works and is fun for everyone is to remain flexible, have realistic expectations, and stay open to change if it'll improve the game for everyone. After my whole section about how starting small is a mistake, this one is gonna feel even more egregious, but this was a mistake that I made in my first homebrew campaign. I had all these big, complex, interesting plans for the larger scale plot, but completely failed to make sure that getting there was also interesting. It's very exciting to imagine your players slowly working their way through their adventures, getting to know one another and growing in power, to finally climactically battle a great foe and triumph. But not to be a downer, but a lot of D&D games never make it to the end. And even if they do, it's important to remember that most of your players' experiences will be in the moment to moment. They'll be in specific shops or towns or talking to specific NPCs. If you focus exclusively on the big picture, the actual boots on the ground gameplay will suffer for it. So yes, figure out what major factors are influencing your world. And by all means, think about the big bad's dastardly plan. But don't forget to also imagine yourself walking around the town where your players will be learning about this intrigue and picking up those breadcrumbs that will eventually lead them there. Who lives here? What do they do all day? And what's happening here that's going to be fun and interesting for your players to engage with? This is the kind of foundational information that can be easy to forget if you're too zoomed out. Listen, I love a good lore dump, but even I don't want to have to read 10 pages of single-spaced fantasy history in order to start playing a game. These characters are supposed to live in this world, and if players have to memorize pages and pages of information in order to understand it, you are going to end up with some players who just don't understand it. Not everyone has the attention span or the learning style to take in information that way. Even when you're reading a book, it's a hallmark of a great writer when the exposition about the world can be delivered as part of the story instead of as a heavy-handed, information-dense prologue. In D&D, we have so many opportunities to deliver world building in a more organic way. Ideally, your players will learn about the world as they navigate it, by observing how this information actually impacts their character and the world around them. Instead of spending 15 minutes describing the entire ecosystem of an area when players enter it, let them learn the details as they perform nature or perception checks, or hunt for food or tracks. Let NPCs mention the details of the weather or the local flora and fauna. 
persona. That way, players are learning the information as it becomes relevant or as they ask for it. I'm not by any means saying don't describe your world. A little narrative when players enter a new space or meet a new person can be very immersive, but these descriptions will have more punch and more sticking power if you don't overdo it. You can and should know details about your world that are not handed to your players on a silver platter. Ask yourself what information is need to know and what information will make them curious and want to learn more. They'll learn it and internalize it better if they are receiving it in pieces and in context. This last one isn't going to be for everybody. Some DMs want complete control over their world, but I want to mention an option that I think is underutilized, and that is giving your players some power over the world building. This could take a lot of different forms. One of the most common ways that DMs allow players to participate in world building is with their characters' hometowns. In one of my home games, the DM provided a general outline of how an underground kingdom was laid out, but I was basically given complete control over the specific town that my character was from. I ended up writing a whole little agricultural hamlet for her. It made me feel very connected to the character's hometown in a way that I haven't felt with other characters. Plus, when asked questions about this place in character, I feel equipped to answer them confidently and in depth. It's way easier to roleplay Penelope's familiarity with her home when I myself know it inside out. Letting players take part in the world building can help them feel more connected to and more knowledgeable about the world around them. Plus, getting more creative brains involved can give your world depth and variety that might be harder to achieve alone. If you haven't tried this before, consider laying out your large-scale stuff, but letting players do some select detailing in areas that are relevant to their characters. If you're worried about your players' creations fitting with your themes, you can always retain veto power over their inventions, or even work together with them during the creation process. Ultimately, you are the one who gets to decide what ends up on the final world map. Building an entire world is nothing to sneeze at, and by no means can I give you all the information you need about how to world build in two YouTube videos, but hopefully this will help you avoid common pitfalls and refine your own world building. If you want to dive a little deeper into the world building rabbit hole, you definitely need to watch my domestic D&D video next. If you want to establish local traditions like festivals and ceremonies, or just learn more about how businesses and land ownership and homesteading can work in your world, this one is a fantastic resource. And if you have specific world building questions, feel free to hit me with them in the comments.